Come on. Yeah. Pull tabs help. And here we have the controller. Okay, now I've said many, many times before that I really like having two colors on things. So I really appreciate the white and black mix on here. I think that actually looks really nice. Uh, ooh, that feels interesting. So even though we're a couple weeks away from the release of the PS5, they've already started putting out their controllers on store shelves. So I went ahead and wanted to grab one right away and compare it to my experiences with the Xbox Series X controller, which I got to have some extended period of time with during the preview program. So we're gonna see how these two controllers feel, handle, how they change from their previous controller, and just give some thoughts on how they are. Now, obviously I don't have access to a PS5 right now, so there are some limitations to what I can test with on the DualSense controller for right now. So I do plan on giving updated thoughts on this controller once we're able to do a full review. So make sure you're subscribed not to miss out on that. Okay, so I've spent some time with the DualSense controller and there's a few different things I wanna cover. Specifically, how the DualSense differs from the DualShock 4, how the Xbox Series X controller differs from the Xbox One, and of course, how these two controllers stack up side by side. And we're gonna start by talking about the DualSense, cause I mean, come on, it's the new shiny thing in this video. Like I said, when I was doing my little unboxing and initial impressions of the controller, one of the immediately noticeable different things about this is the redesigned grip shape and overall, well, shape of the controller. Again, this is very similar to a lot more controllers out on the market rather than the more oblong design of the DualShock 4 and personally I find it to be much more comfortable. I could see an argument for the DualShock 4 design being a little more comfortable for someone with smaller hands especially when it comes to reaching some of these higher up buttons but for me the DualSense has been an improvement. Something that surprised me about this though is that while initially on first impression this looks very different from a DualShock 4, when you get into the nitty gritty of how a lot of these sticks and buttons feel, it's very much the same. Side by side when you're pressing the front facing buttons and the D-pad and trying out the triggers, at least when you're not using the adaptive trigger feature, do feel pretty much the same. The one specific exception to this is the sticks. The DualSense sticks have this anti-friction ring around it that causes it to be this very smooth motion when you're circling it around. In the case of the DualShock 4, or you feel a little more noticeable friction. It wasn't particularly bad by any means, but compared to the DualSense, you do notice it a lot more where it's nice and smooth here. Now, I don't want you to take my comment on the buttons feeling very similar to the DualShock 4 as necessarily a bad thing. The DualShock 4 buttons feel great, so it doesn't really need to be changed all that much. And again, the really big differences here are the grip shape and a lot of the extra features that the controller has. Now, I'm not able to test a lot of these right now because obviously I don't have a PS5 to use it on, but the main things worth noting is that the DualSense features a more advanced rumble feature compared to the DualShock 4 with its new haptic feedback. Of course, there's the concept of adaptive triggers where there are internal parts here that make it so that depending on what's happening in game, the amount of tension on the triggers will change, including even making you not being able to press down in the first place, and the built-in microphone, which does have a mute button right here, so if you don't want the mic to be picking you up, you can just press that to turn it off. The end result here is a controller that feels very familiar to the DualShock 4 in some specific ways, like with the D-pad and the sticks and the buttons, but at the end of the day, does feel like something brand new and fresh thanks to its redesigned grip and brand new features. Now, by comparison, the Xbox Series X controller is a very fine-tuning, refined version of the Xbox One controller. This is not nearly as drastic of a change. There's only a couple things really worth pointing out right away as far as major differences, and there's a few little subtle things we can talk about. On the subtle side of things really quick, the controller's weight distribution does feel ever so slightly different from the Xbox One controller. It favors the grips a little more, which I do like. The triggers on it now have this little bit of texturing, which some Xbox One Special Edition controllers had, but was not standard, and the front bumpers are just a little more raised compared to an Xbox One. When it comes to drastic changes, there's really only three major things. One, it's been changed to a USB-C port instead of micro USB, which is a change featured on the DualSense controller as well. The D-pad has been replaced with this faceted design that is similar to the Xbox Elite controller, which I personally find a major improvement. The actual feel of the D-pad is still very similar to the Xbox One controller as far as the feedback and clickiness of it goes, but the addition of these faceted segments and giving it just the rounded edge makes it much better for doing things like rolling inputs. The one last major addition is of course the one new button right here, the share button, which just adds an easier way of doing some social network features on the Xbox Series X by pressing it to take a screenshot or holding it to record gameplay. And that's 
really it as far as differences go. If you have used an Xbox One controller, this is going to feel perfectly right at home for you. It's very much the approach of if it's not broke, don't fix it, which honestly I can appreciate. I really liked the Xbox One controller. I know it's not necessarily the opinion of everyone, but I did find that to be a more comfortable design than the DualShock 4, so I understand sticking with the same design. However, there is something to be said for the concept of you know, basically releasing a new system with a very similar controller versus the PlayStation approach of just making something that feels completely brand new. And this is what brings us to directly comparing these two controllers. Now, I will say at the end of the day, these are both very comfortable. I don't really have any major complaints as far as the general design of these controllers. They both feel great. I'm able to use them for an extended period of time without any kind of discomfort. Buttons, sticks, everything is good. But if we really want to get into the in-depths of what feels different about them and what I might like or dislike more about each one, there's a couple main things that really stick out. First off, like I mentioned with the DualSense compared to the DualShock controller, it has this anti-friction ring, which the Xbox Series X controller is missing. Now there is very little friction when moving the stick in a circular motion, but if we really want to get just very specific on the areas where there are differences, you do get just a little bit of that kind of grating feeling that is not present on the DualSense. Another difference is the grip shape. While the DualSense is much closer in shape to an Xbox Series X controller than the DualShock 4 was, there are still some slight differences. Most noticeably, the handles on it are a little bit thinner. Personally, I did find this to be a little more comfortable. It just felt right in my hands right away. One part of it that's a little more awkward to me are these cutoff edges right here. I kind of wish it still had the rounded tips. It's not a huge deal, but it just feels a little bit different to me and a bit off. The front side is a little bit different. The Xbox Series X controller has the kind of matte finish that we're used to feeling on most controllers, where the DualSense has this kind of satin finish to it. It just feels a little bit smoother, which I do like, and it gives it a little bit of reflectiveness. Not quite the same level as something like a gloss finish, but a happy midpoint between that and a traditional matte. As far as other minute differences in buttons go, the front-facing buttons feel fairly similar. Where I'm noticing a little more difference is on the D-pads and the triggers. Now again, with the DualSense, some of this is gonna vary a little bit in the future because adaptive triggers are going to mess with that. But I will say as far as the basic tension of these controllers go and just the way the trigger pull feels to me and the feel of it, I found the Series X to be a bit more comfortable. And lastly, as far as D-pads go, the Xbox continues to have this very clicky feeling one, which I do find to be an improvement over the Xbox One because again, the faceted reshaped design. Whereas the DualSense, like the DualShock 4, has that softer style D-pad that personally, I don't like quite as much. I think this one's a little more personal preference. I will give that. I don't think this is necessarily a one is flat out better than the other. I just found that the faceted clicky design on the Xbox Series X felt a little nicer. Again, all of this is getting extremely nitty gritty. I don't think any of these differences are significant enough to really be like one controller is flat out better than the other, at least as far as comfort goes. What's gonna be really interesting though is when we compare the full blown new functionalities of the DualSense and see how much that really sets it apart from the continued kind of baseline functions of the Xbox Series X controller. Now there's one last thing I wanna talk about that's been kind of a long term sore subject when it comes to Xbox versus PlayStation controllers, and that's rechargeable battery versus using double A's. Look, I understand the benefits of allowing for AA battery support. There are some valid reasons to use that over something that's rechargeable, but at the end of the day, especially when it comes to convenience, I really wish Xbox would just start supporting rechargeable batteries right out of the gate. What I really think would be a happy midpoint and a great result is if it was just a little more standardized to have these controllers be shipped with rechargeable battery packs so that you, the consumer, have a choice of either using that or using AA's when absolutely necessary. Are there gonna be play and charge kits for this that you can buy separately if you want that functionality? Yes. But honestly, I really think it should just be a stock aspect of the controller, at least with the one that comes with your system, if not every single one you buy after that point. Again, this is a little bit of a sore subject. I know there are some people who are very passionate about why they want AA support or why they just want to have a straight rechargeable controller. At the end of the day, I lean towards the side of both would be great for this, but if I'm picking one or the other, I like the fact that the DualSense is just a rechargeable one right away. So those are my thoughts on the Xbox Series X and DualSense controller right now. Again, I think some of this is definitely subject to change once I have more experience with playing actual games on the next-gen systems with these controllers. So when I do an eventual comparison of Xbox Series X versus PS5, this is gonna be one of the things I will definitely dive into and update. So if you don't wanna miss out on that content, make sure to subscribe and I will see you guys later.